Hi, my name is Valerie Robitaille, and I am James Robitaille's wife. James is the designer of the Quantum Energy Generator, or QEG. I'm also the co-founder of the Fix the World organization with my daughter, Naima Fagan, also known as Hope Girl. And we have been on this quest. I'm James Robitaille. Um, I'm a, a career electronics engineer, um, and I left uh, the mainstream work world in uh, 2012. Um, and I've, I've uh, been working on electronics and electrical things and mechanical things my whole life. Sometimes all I would have to do is just ask them to come over to a malfunctioning machine whether it's a kitchen appliance or a computer or anything technical and sometimes just his presence will make that thing run right. I can't explain it, but it's definitely a thing. Um, it's just, I've always said uh, it's a gift and I, I've never taken credit for it uh, myself. I'm, I'm a, a non-degreed engineer. So most everything that, uh, that I've learned, I've taught myself. Um, and it turns out that, uh, strangely enough, everything that I selected to learn about throughout my whole life has become uh, required, in, required experience for the QEG project. My name is Tavon Rivers. Uh, I'm a technician with over 15 years of experience. Uh, my careers have extended into the Navy and into the IT uh, industry. Um, first as a hardware technician and then into uh, more on the software side. I've always had an interest in alternative energy. Um, I first got interested by looking at the work of Eric Dollard and uh, some of the other researchers, Bedini, um, the videos of Linderman and, and some of the other uh, people who've been in alternative energy for a couple of decades. Uh, and so I was on the forums uh, around 2014 and then I first saw a video of the open source release of the QEG and I wanted to try to understand this new device. Um, it was the first device I have ever seen where um, someone had, gave the plans to where you can build your own generator. You know, I assumed <clears throat> that there were some free energy devices out there that were operating and that if we dug deep enough that we would find, uh, we would be able to find devices and find people to talk to uh, to figure out how to do this. Well, after we had done some research, I realized that it hasn't happened yet and I was really amazed to see that no one had successfully open sourced uh, a free energy device. When we first open sourced the QEG in March of 2014, it felt like we were on the verge of doing something meaningful for the planet and its peoples because our plan was to figure this thing out, this free energy device, and show people how to make it so that people would become uh, unenslaved by the big energy companies and they would be able to build their own devices. I was very hopeful that this was a good thing and that it would be received favorably, which mostly it was but we did have some trouble, which led me to believe that it's not so easy to do something good. Um, and you know, we, we did a lot more research and we began to find out about the uh, previous inventors and learn about the suppression and, and how some had even been murdered uh, by big oil concerns and, and uh, um, the powers that be, you know, and we, <laughs> we were, pretty naive at first, but uh, we, we've learned our lesson now. So it took me time to kind of understand the information that was being put on the forums. A lot of, as you can imagine, uh, trolling behavior, and, but positive enforcement about the technology is what got me interested. 
And when I found out that the QEG family um, were uh, coming to the UK, um, and you know, I was living at the UK at the time, that was when it got my interest, and I tried to, uh, that's when I wanted to meet and, and join the bill. Really, the, the motivation uh, for releasing the QEG uh, was for the benefit of mankind. We just wanted to do something to make a difference. Um, and the more the, the, uh, we developed the project and, and talked about it and thought about it, and, and uh, we began to realize that uh, if it hasn't been done before, that it was our assignment. Some of the experiences that we've had over the past couple of years have had to do with hate. Uh, I don't know if that hate comes from jealousy or if people are actually being paid to make smear campaigns and spew hatred towards inventors. We've heard a lot about uh, trolls and companies that have dirty tactics to discourage inventors. Well, we're, uh, we're Christ this family is Christians, as you know, um, and we, we kind of got, uh, um, got it into our spirit that the importance of this, of this project was, uh, was greater than, than we even realized. As technology and the way things are done seems to progress, it's more towards open source. And now it's gone from open source software to open source hardware. But I think what we're seeing is a paradigm shift. There have been many um, astounding adventures on, in, uh, with this project. If you were to go on the internet maybe in the late 90s and you started typing in the word free energy, you get a set of inventors and researchers on the topic, and there wasn't very many of them. But I can name a few names that were there during that time, like Searle, um, Bearden, um, Bedini, uh, and Dollard, Linderman. Um, you know, these people have been researching free energy for a long time. But what I'm seeing is a paradigm shift in what to do with that technology. Uh, in addition to those inventors, the paradigm before used to always be, or seem to be, that the inventor has to get a patent. And then once they have a patent, secured one, that surely they can go to a company and, and, or an investor and get lots of money for their device, only to find that either the invention does not get released, which clearly is the case, or is suppressed, or something happens to the inventor, and the technology is lost. Um, it, so that time, I think, was a time where the internet was not available, access, alternative media did not exist. And you know, if you're an inventor during that time, it's understandable, you're very protective of, of your device and there are very few routes where you can share it if you wanted to, other than some road shows and some conferences. Um, we know that the, the normal route, or the norm, normal route for something like this is uh, that if an inventor has a, has a machine that uh, he has confidence in, um, you know, a generator, and it, it's uh, a unique design, you know, his own design. The normal thing that you would, uh, that you would do is go f uh, for patent protection uh, so that someone doesn't steal the design and, and build it. And, uh, and the, the motivation is, is uh, you know, for protection. Um, so one of, the, one of the concerns when we were looking for a machine is we had to make sure that uh, it wasn't patented. The, the QEG is based on Tesla technology and it's, in, uh, it's been in public domain for a long time. So it's not a, there are no pat patent issues uh, with this device. The times are changing now. I mean, everything is open source. Uh, if you can go online and you're looking for certain information, you're probably bound to find it. It's just, it just depends on your tenacity and asking the right questions. And then you'll probably find that one web page that will have exactly your answer. From just 
releasing the plans, uh, we had a, a deluge of emails immediately uh, after that, and we we tried to figure out the best way to uh, to follow up with uh, with releasing the plans, and eventually we determined that we were going to teach people how to build these. We're in the realm of open source now. No longer does it suit an inventor to be protective of their device. It doesn't suit them because anyone who open sources a new innovation, they have such a big advantage because when they open source those designs and when they do it in a way that allows them to grow as a business and they share it with a community of people who are interested, there's instant feedback. The software community has shown that that works time and time again. Open source is the way to go. It is the future. It's happening now. These are some of the, some of the problems we've been able to work around with uh, with the QEG. There's no patent issues to be concerned with. Um, we don't have any non-disclosure agreements because the the plans were open sourced in the first place. Um, and the you know we have uh, uh, we've done a couple of seminars. And I, I personally work with uh, about 60 uh, groups and individuals that, that uh, are my students and, and builders uh, uh, developing the machine. You know, every, every step uh, that we reach, every uh, milestone that we, re that we reach in the development, um, I release it. And other, other builders, you know, if they come up with uh, an innovation, um, improvements, uh, new experiment results. Um, these are all released to the rest of the uh, individuals and teams that are working on the QEG. We, we share all the uh, technical information, the engineering data. Uh, so it's, it's truly a, a unique situation where we're, we're co-developing this machine. And when we reach the goal, um, Potentially, there's potentially hundreds of machines that will be coming online close to the same time. The fears of the past, those goblins, those gargoyles that would kind of guard or be the gatekeepers of who would have such access to technology and who wouldn't, I think those, those walls are, 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 are disappearing. So this is a very exciting time. It's a very uh, uh, turbulent time, but it's also an opportunity for people to really spread their wings and, and, and to just go out there and just make something new. And you know we, we've done uh, we've done a couple of programs where we tried to explain uh, the way that uh, mainstream corporations will come out with a new device um, they basically will dedicate a, a portion uh, of their personnel to a new project and it can be uh, you know 5, 10, 15 uh, people on a project, um, engineers on a project, and there's a, um, there's a budget set aside, you know, often is a multi-million multi -million dollar budget, um, <clears throat> and the, the, the team, the design team will have uh, years sometimes to, to develop the design behind closed doors. Um, and all, all the people working on the design are required to sign non-disclosure agreements and not talk about the design uh, so that all the, all the uh, income that's generated from this new design stays within the corporation and, and uh, it's all controlled. Um, well, with this device, we have a, an even larger team of engineers. We have anyone on the planet that wants to that decides to build, that, that they want to build one of these machines, they can do so. We decided that we weren't going to uh, do the thing that everybody does on YouTube. You know, as soon as they put something together, uh, immediately demonstrate it. Um, you know, they immediately do a video and demonstrate it. And we have learned that uh, many good people um, Bad, very bad things have happened to some very good people uh, from demonstrating uh, these machines. So we decided that we're not going to build them and we're not going to sell them. We're going to teach people how to build them for themselves. And that's the way that this 
this technology can be success successfully released without uh, without suppression. Um, and you know, if we if we can teach enough people to build these machines and build enough machines, um, well, we can release them close to the same time in in many different countries. Then there's there's uh, really no no way that it can be suppressed. Mm. My wish for the QEG projects and other technologies that can accommodate the QEG in the Tesla Gen is to have units operating at the same time at the various groups who are working on it right alongside of us um, in their garages and during the, that time we have at least one unit powering um, a local tribal village um, doing something, either running their lights, um, because these areas, some of these remote areas have no lights, um, and or um, running a um, reverse osmosis water machine. Something, you know, that's, that's basically what I like to see. That, that in itself, that, that drives the point home that and your energy can be synthesized and created anywhere in space and we can use it to power any load including something that creates water from the air and that says it all. I feel grateful that I've been able to come up with a project that will actually uh, do something to improve the conditions on this planet. I wanted to use my skills and my knowledge somehow to improve uh, life for, for uh, my fellow man. That's, that's been something that uh, has been on my heart. Uh, so this, this also goes toward uh, convincing me that this, you know, that this project was uh, the thing that I've been training for all, all my life. My family back in the States is in New Jersey and Pennsylvania and Ohio. And these states are heavily, um, what's the word? Uh, there's a pall over these states, in my opinion. I mean, other people may not notice it, but I notice in Pennsylvania when I go to stores or do something in town that people are sad or angry or they look numb um, and I understand because the the system has everybody feeling pressure all the time pressure pressure to pay the rent and be a good parent and pay the utility companies and you know do all the activities that is expected of an American family or an American individual um, you know work 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 and if you work you're told if you work hard enough and long enough that it'll pay off and the fact that it doesn't pay off ever in the United States that people are suffering and people are being crushed by the system that is telling the world makes the United States the greatest country in the world. No, no, no. They are being crushed. Um, I, I understand the, the atmosphere is uh, sad, angry, and numb. I was in an IT career, um, and it, it's just for me, I thought it was a dead end. Uh, the, the, I, I saw it as there's only so many years I can see myself doing this particular job. Uh, so when the opportunity came to do something different, I, I decided to just go ahead and take the plunge. You know, I've always wanted to do something that I thought would really positively impact people, um, something that people really need. that. I thought my skills can actually go towards making something uh, feasible, making something work. And so being a part of the 
of the team, being part of the uh, Fixed Oil family. I thought that was an opportunity. Um, you know, the place I was coming from, you know, it's, it's 9 to 5, everyone's having to, 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 to work to, to, to survive. And it was a time that I felt like I wanted to see something different. For me, I wanted, to, I wanted a change. And so I left, uh, I left England and I came here to uh, North Africa, to Morocco. And I mean, the environment here, um, it, it's, it's amazing. It's a completely different world. Uh, we, when we first released the plans, we had uh, invitations from uh, from many people, uh, and one of the inv invitations was from a group of bloggers that we had been working with. Um, this group was living in Morocco at the time, and we had been discussing an application for the machine. Um, like I said earlier, um, we, we wanted to apply this, uh, this device in the best way possible where, where it would uh, uh, have the greatest effect and, and do the greatest good. Um, so we, we looked for projects like uh, where can we supply electricity where there is none uh, and, and help some people directly, you know, right at, right at the grassroots level. And we were discussing with these bloggers, and they were telling us that in the town they lived in, that the, the ladies had to uh, carry buckets uh, and go and draw water and carry it back to their homes. A um, couple times a day, they would have to just go in and uh, actually lower the rope, crank the rope down into the, into the well, and then crank it back up. Uh, so obviously, this was an application for a water pump, a simple water pump. Uh, so the, the idea developed that we would come to Morocco and uh, put the QEG together and power a water pump, use it to power a water pump in, the, in this poor community of Aushtam. Uh, so we came to Morocco to build. And while we were here, uh, we got to know the, the area quite a bit. Uh, the region around here and uh, began to develop the idea of having the home office for Fix the World, SARL, here in Morocco because um, we observed that the business climate here is much better than in the U.S. Um, in Morocco, there, you, don't, you basically don't have the government trying to control your behavior uh, as, as you have in the U.S. Um, there are, you know, you don't have a, a, as many rules and regulations and fees and people with their hands in your pockets. Um, it's, a, it's a simpler uh, system. And basically, it's, it's, uh, that's the reason that we, we settled, uh, we decided to, to put uh, Fix the World here in Morocco, it's because of the, the uh, business climate, it's, uh, much less oppressive than in the U.S. And we're just so grateful to be here in this country. Um, and the reason that we're here is so that we can develop the QEG in peace and without really any fear. Um, I mean, to give you an example, back in the, in the States, I started to use some organite in the house because I just, I felt the frequencies, I felt all the machines going on, whether it was the heater or the refrigerator or whatever. And so I started to really use organite um, to shield myself and I started to pray also, and immediately black helicopters would show up as if there's some kind of, you know, the organized creating some kind of uh, hole in their blanket that they have around us. And it happened a couple of times. So I don't feel that it's a coincidence. Um, and the other people can attest to that as well. But none of that happens here. 
no black helicopter fear, no fear of running a machine um, and you know making a smaller version to take into the mountains for people that have no electricity, for people that have been held down and oppressed, you know, and starting to see generations thrive. This is how we begin to change and fix the what has been done to people on the planet. So human transaction and commerce done on this, at least in this country and probably in most of this continent is, is much different from um, I think the Western society where if you want to pay for a service or, or, or you need something, you don't necessarily need a human being at the end of it. You, you know, you just need an account, your credit card, um, and some automated process where you get whatever it is you, you want or you think you need. Um, but here, um, you beat someone, and if it's food, actually, you're actually more in the market. You're actually in the street where the vegetables and the fruit and, and the grilled chicken is, and there's someone doing all these things. If you're trying to find a place to park in the middle of the town, you can park on the curb, but you got someone who's put on an orange vest because they can make a couple of pennies to help you park the vehicle. Um, there's human interaction at almost every every part of every transaction that you do, and that's still here. I don't see a computerized Panopticon thing happening here. It's just people are people are very communal. They, 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 they like to be part of your experience. If you need help, you'll have many people trying to help you at the same time. DHL, for example, um, when we first got our account set up, I mean, I was expecting that we'd just fill out an online form and that's what we did. But what we actually had is a follow-up email and a phone call and someone drove from Tangier, which is about a 45 to a 50 minute drive from here, to us just to come and see us and to sit down and have a, a, a discussion with us. You know, they wanted to know the nature of our business, um, what we do, and he had us fill out some forms, you know, with broken French and uh, but he his better English. Um, we're able to 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 fill out the, the the documentation. He came back on a second visit, and uh, that was it. But the. You know, that's not something you would expect normally if you wanted to set up a membership with a courier is to have someone come to you, to your home, and, and um, you know, basically hold your hand through the, entire, through the entire process. So, yeah, that was a good experience. But that's, that's an example of the trend, of the interaction that, that you have here. What are the people like in Morocco? Well, the, pe the people are uh, uh, the way that they should be. <laughs> um, People live a little closer to the earth here, and that appeals greatly to me. Um, I, I've always, um, you know, I've always thought that a minimum of government intervention is uh, is uh, all all that we need, you know, as as citizens, um, and that's what it's like here. Uh, the people are wonderful. We, everyone always has a smile for you. Um, and the culture is quite different. Um, the people here have uh, an ingrained sense of uh, hospitality that you don't really see anymore in the U.S. You used to see it more, um, and and you know more in the southern states, but in recent years. People in in, uh, in the U.S. are uh, different, you know, not as happy. Here, the people are happy, and everyone wants to help, especially if they realize that you're uh, a foreigner. They want to help you, you know. That's that's the. Uh, it really is. You can tell as soon as you set foot here, you'll you'll be able to tell that uh, the hospitality is actually part of the culture. Everyone was raised to help their neighbor, to say hello, to, to hug. You know, everyone hugs each other around the neck here. Um, and kisses each other, men, men with men and women with women and men with women uh, just as a greeting. You know, there's a hug and a kiss. And um, what do you need? How can I help you? It's, uh, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful culture. 
And even though we don't speak the language, you know, one of us speaks a little French and another speaks a little Spanish and another maybe a little Arabic, it doesn't matter uh, most of the time. There are times where it's very stressful because we may need a part or a service, um, but mostly the relationships that we have with people here, um, we've, we've learned how to communicate with our eyes, our hand gestures. Uh, we have made friends here and um, it, it's just, it's very pleasant, very, very pleasant to, to be in this country, seeing the culture, being a part of the culture. It's just a wonderful thing. You have a lot of uh, a lot of life, you know, a lot of you just just people talking in foreign tongues, um, and and what I see is opportunity. What we saw is opportunity with the opening of the community center, you know, where where there's um, people, human interaction, all of its fullness is in your face. So like when you know someone's on the street, right next to new buildings that are being put up. You know, we saw it as an opportunity. You know, we found out that a community center was abandoned. You know, we opened it up. Um, it's just, you can do things here. You can just go and just get something going. And I didn't feel that was the case where I came from. I thought that was that, that it was a barrier, but here it's not. The Tesla Gym Project is the culmination of about 18 months of research that was established uh, not too long after the disclosure of the QEG um, by enthusiasts on forums and on various websites that wanted to create a smaller unit. So I participated in that early on. And during the development of the project, um, I started forming relationships between what I thought would be manufacturers that would be able to make this move forward, but at a, um, a reasonable price. You know, if you're someone who's just trying to start a new project, create a prototype, what have you, the place you want to build it is China. Um, I had a very limited budget, um, but I started doing my research to see what it would take to make the parts for a generator, like the rotor and the stator, and it was a whole learning experience. But I can say when it comes to technology, if you're trying to prototype something quickly and, and you're on a budget, China is the way to go. So now the project's matured to where it is now um, with the campaign, with this Tesla Gym project, and uh, all the parts I'm getting made are made in China, or have been made in China. Um, during this program, uh, during this experience, um, the CAD files were made, Diagrams are made, uh, obtain quotations from these companies, and it's simply when it comes to price and the speed at which parts are made and, and that can get back to you, unless you have instant access to a machinist or you're, you're one yourself or you have a friend who works in a CNC shop, uh, I, I source China. So all my parts for the Tesogen are made in, in, in China, but in order to do this, um, there's a communication gap that needs to be established. Uh, so mainly it's first thing is the time difference. If you're in the West, Western Hemisphere, you know, anywhere from uh, GMT <laughs> Europe on to uh, the West Coast of the United States, the time difference is enough so that you have to actually plan to communicate with someone in China. So if you have a Skype call or a Zoom chat um, and or WeChat, they use WeChat or WhatsApp over, over in the Far East. Um, you find out who the manufacturer is for the part you need. Either you go on like AliExpress, Alibaba, some of these other places where they have a list of manufacturers online that you go to to service your part and you have to communicate with them. If they agree to your part and they offer you an invoice and a quote to have your part done, you have to send that CAD file, this 3D computer file of the part. This is the, this is the file that you send for them to evaluate the part that you want made and for them to put into the machine for CNC fabrication. That is how they make parts nowadays is with these machines. 
So for this, this was a whole learning experience for me. And maybe someday I'll do an ebook on this, but um, it is kind of what you'd call prototyping. It's a prototyping um, production uh, um, phase, but it's also my, what would be micromanufacturing, where you, from concept to creation, um, you have to go through the process of what it takes in order to get that part from your idea to a sketch to something that's sitting on your desk. Uh, so uh, that is why I get parts made in China because of the cost. Um, and, and when it comes to doing concepts, I mean, like, I didn't have a lot of money. So, and now that we have support, we have people who are following the work and who are supporting, uh, supporting the campaign. And the big thanks to you all, all out there. Um, we're getting ready to co-develop together on this project. It's still very new, the Mini QEG, uh, but this process, I, I believe, is the way forward in the future. Anyone, if, they're, uh, if they have a design, if they're an inventor, anything, um, you know, you can go online and from concept to creation you can get something made, especially with 3D printers. So um, it's an interesting time um, and and you have to really have your stuff together. You have to be organized. But if you, if you know where to go and who to go to, you can get pretty much um, whatever you need. Everything, everything that we do in the modern world is based on uh, uh, energy. The, you know, the, the money that, uh, uh, the salaries that we make, the income that we have, um, you know, the cost of living. Uh, I've heard the figure, eighty percent of our income goes uh, for energy costs. Um, Maybe not directly like paying the gas bill or the electric bill, uh, but the cost of energy is figured into the prices of all consumer items, you know, from, from automobiles and, and big ticket appliances uh, down to, you know, plastic toys. Plastic toys, you know, plastic comes from, uh, uh, from petroleum, so, you know, it's, it's uh, deeply embedded in our uh, in our system of commerce and, and uh, uh, especially in the, uh, in the developed countries. Myself and the Fix the World organization feels that the possibility of getting free energy to people on the planet is one of the most important changes that we can make because it seems that energy is behind just about everything. Um, without proper energy, without lights or heating devices or um, you know electronics in this day and age, people simply cannot thrive. I mean, and energy is the base for everything. I believe that nothing, everything operates on access to energy. Um, and then from that is civilization. So, you know, if there are devices, we know there are devices that are out there that have been suppressed, that are hidden, or for whatever reason, um, the knowledge has not been known for people to create a device of their own or for their communities. And this technology is out there to where this is possible, uh, then that means that everything else would be much cheaper if everyone had access to clean energy. Uh, the environment would be clean. Um, there would be no pollution. That in itself is the reason why everyone should be required to learn how, how these things work. Um, I, I truly believe uh, when a device, open source device, is made available and its knowledge is made available to the public, if it was taught to you know, uh, a science student in high school, that within a generation we can literally change this planet. 
and uh, it's real. It's real, and it might not be as difficult as we would think. I think it just means we have to change our thinking and what we've been told.